I think we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone. This is the breakout session on menopause. So if everybody's here for menopause, just sit back, have a seat. If you're supposed to eat something else, or you sit. <laughs> um, this is called Managing Menopause, What's New? Our speaker today is Ann Moore. She is the program director for the Women's Health Nurse Practitioner Program at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. She is nationally recognized as a thought leader and clinician in the area of women's health with a particular focus in menopausal care. Please join me in welcoming Ann Moore. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you all here. So I'm not just talking to an empty room. That's good. Um, I am. Uh, I was saying earlier. I'm. Uh, I'm only going to be in that position at Vanderbilt until tomorrow, oh. and uh, I'm taking an early retirement. So after 22 years of teaching, I'm going to be doing a new thing, uh, which is working for the Department of Health and um, Public Health in Nashville. Uh, so it's going to be a new um, a new career, and I'm kind of looking forward to it. Public health is something I've not done before, and um, I will say this: having not been in the, gone in that direction before, and having now gone across the state and done site visits because I'm at central office, uh, I can say with um, a, a great deal of certainty that if you want good health care, go to them. They get great health care. Um, it's not a system that's uh, you know revenue driven, and um, I've been very impressed. So anyway, that's the new part of my life. Um, the second thing is that I turned 60 a week ago. Your birthday? <laughs> and I brought my prop. Yeah. I was actually running around looking for the yeah. fans. There's one group that had, um, yeah. that had fans, and I saw it. Yeah. On it. Is that what it is? Yeah. Well, anyway, this is my substitute. Um, so <clears throat> I feel um, academically qualified and personally qualified to be able to discuss this topic of menopause with you ladies today. And what Peggy Burrell had asked me to do was really go over some of the newer stuff that's out there from a standpoint of symptom management, and there is some new stuff. Um, and we're going to go into some of the, as soon as I can turn off my telephone, excuse me, um, we'll go into some of the newer, um, you know, information about medications, treatments, and, and so on to, to kind of bring you up to speed with some of the choices that you might have. Okay? Now... Anybody that's heard me lecture over the past couple of decades knows that I, I do love a couple of slides. This is one of them. And this actually looks at kind of, welcome, kind of the trajectory of what happens uh, with menopause. Now, let me just say, and here are the ages that go across this horizontal axis at the bottom. It's not like all of a sudden you wake up one morning and your estrogen hits the <laughs> toilet. Okay? It doesn't drop like that. But it does kind of, this is just sort of a, 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 a sort of a demonstration of what happens over time. And we begin to experience symptoms, and not all of us will do that, by the way. My mother never had menopausal symptoms. Maybe men as well get out. Um, but she never did. She was one to say, I never had a hot flash in my life. Really? Um, so she never did, but and some women won't do that. But what happens is you have um, a subjective response to a decline in estrogen, and it's going to not be everybody's going to not have the same set point for that. So you know whatever that uh, relationship is that you have with your own endogenous estrogen, as that begins to decline, um, women will experience uh, vasomotor symptoms or hot flashing, depending on the person. Okay. So hot flushes, um, and the flushing, actually, you'll, you'll see it written as hot flashes, hot flushes. Flushing, uh, if you're looking at the real definition, is that lovely occurrence of the redness that comes up from your chest and goes up into your face. Now, some women will complain of hot flashing but not show that physical manifestation of the flush. Some of us will do both. Um, but if you look at European literature, they'll always speak of it as hot flushing. Now, hot flushing, hot flashing, and night sweating is what we think contributes to the mood, sleep, cognitive changes, and so forth that go along with this time frame. Because you're just not getting the same kind of restorative sleep that you got before you started having night sweats. Okay? Even if you don't wake up to experience, aha, I'm having a night sweat, the quality, come on in, the quality of your sleep is impaired, and this has been studied for years. 
so that, you know, the next day you're probably not in the greatest mood, you're probably not on top of your game, and I'll, I've had a number of women over time come and see me, and I still have an active uh, private practice. They come to see me and go, you know, I'm just not there. I'm just, you know, I'm losing it. I think I'm, you know, I've got dementia. I can't think anymore. And a lot of times I think it has to do with the fact that they're just not getting good restorative sleep. But it's, it's a frightening thing to them because they don't wake up to appreciate the fact that they're having a night sweat. Okay? And then you have the long-term disease processes that can occur as we go through that trajectory of, um, of aging and, and estrogen loss, which actually does have an impact or impacts urogenital symptoms. And these include things like vaginal dryness, um, um, pain with intercourse, um, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and cognitive change, there's not a clear relationship from a perspective of estrogen loss, but clearly these are things that are, are more, risk, more risk factors for women as they get older, particularly cardiovascular disease. Osteoporosis, I'm not going to go into much today because it's a whole other in-depth lecture, but I think that that's one of my favorite things certainly to talk about because we don't talk about it as much as we should. Um, it's the, the silent thing. It's the thing that takes women away from the mainstream. It's the thing that we don't know what happened to Miss So-and-so. She was at Kroger last week, and I haven't seen her for a while, and I wonder where she went. Well, she went home, uh, or she went to the nursing facility, or she went to long-term care because she, she broke a hip. Um, and so these people kind of disappear from our conscious radar, and it's because they you know, had an incident, a fall, um, and now we don't really follow them through that trajectory of, of, um, of convalescence. And we may not ever see them out and being fully productive again, uh, depending on the degree of rehab or the degree of, of ability to, to overcome those, those fractures. So here again are some of the symptoms that women complain of. Vasomotor symptoms or hot flashing type related symptoms can include headache, palpitations, night sweats, and again, insomnia or sleep disturbance. So I really kind of put that out again to think of that not as just the thing that you wake up for. Okay. And, and that's, that's the, the silent piece here. I think that that's disturbing for a lot of women. Um, why can't I put two and two together? You know, why can't I think of that person's name, <laughs> which is a big one for me? Why can't I, um, you know, be as productive as I was, say, a year or so ago? And it may well be because you're just not getting restorative sleep. But you're not having that aha moment, moment where you wake up and, you know, the sheets are drenched. I love that one. My sheets are drenched. You know, I know I'm not getting sleep. My husband or my partner says I'm flailing around all night long. You may not have those signals to tell you that that's what's going on, okay? Vaginal dryness. Um, now stop. Vag sometimes this thing gets a mind of its own. Um, vaginal dryness, pain with intercourse, itching, burning, frequency, urinary frequency, pain, and urgency. All of those go into that middle column of genital urinary symptoms. Um, and then other systemic symptoms. Well, you're going to be fatigued if you don't get good sleep, all right? You're not probably interested in sex if it doesn't feel quite as good as it used to or, uh, you know, it's just not, not interesting. Um, and, and I will tell you that sexual interest decreases as a function of age, period. Not as a function so much of hormones, all right? That's a part of it, but the data indicates that sexual interest just declines as a function of age, period. Um, Anxiety, irritability, and depression, again, I think that certainly builds into the issue of sleep, cognitive difficulties, and so forth. And the backache and stiffness um, also, uh, you know, clearly show up at this, at this point. And um, an aside is, and I know this is going to sound like, you know, kind of crazy talk maybe, but check your mattress. And the reason I say that, I travel or have traveled in the past quite a bit, and I, I told my husband not too long ago, I said, you know what, we got to talk about how long I've had this mattress, because I would go to other places and sleep great. And then I go home and I sleep on my mattress and I wake up and I'm walking like this. And I'm like, now, there's something wrong here. We need to get rid of this mattress, how long have we had it, or something. So, I mean, look at something as fundamental as your, where you're sleeping, how long you've had that darn mattress, because then you're supposed to change them out at, what, seven years or something like that. Don't overlook the obvious. My, my father-in-law used to brag that he'd had the same mattress for 20 years, which was, ooh, 
in a lot of different ways. But yeah, just you know, think about changing where you sleep or what you're sleeping on, particularly if you can draw those kinds of uh, or make those kinds of equations. Because um, I sleep really well on other beds, but not in mine. So we're going to be getting a new mattress pretty soon. Um, the incidence of postmenopausal vasomotor symptoms. Those are some of the primary reasons that perimenopausal, postmenopausal women come to my office. Now, perimenopause is one of those non-medical terms, actually, that speaks to that transition between your last menstrual period and the time that your periods start to become irregular. And some of us that have had hysterectomies, we don't get that signal, maybe. But it's not an abrupt situation. And menopause is not defined by a hormone level. And I've been around a long time doing care. And it wasn't that long ago that you had to have that blood test that said that you had that, what they call FSH level, I think it was 40 or greater. And if you had that FSH level of 40 or greater, your physician or practitioner would tell you that you were menopausal. Now, that's great, but you had a period in two weeks after that. So we don't use, because the hormones go all over the place. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's a sort of an evolutionary process, and it's a retrospective definition. So if you had a period a year ago, and that was the last one you had, then based on the definition of menopause, you're there. And I bring that up to say that if you then have bleeding after that point, you need to get it checked out. Okay, because that is postmenopausal bleeding. And not to put the scare word out there, but I tell students, postmenopausal bleeding is cancer until proven otherwise. Okay, so 12 months ago, had your last menstrual period, haven't bled since, you're good to go. But you're going to have probably hot flashes, vasomotor symptoms if you're one of those people that's going to do that way before you have that last menstrual period. And again, it wasn't so long ago that you had a clinician or a provider say, I can't give you anything to help with that until you've had your last period. Which is kind of mean, actually, when you think about it. So we've come a long way in, in understanding um, you know, how to treat women and understanding that um, that you don't necessarily have to wait for a finite point in time to do an intervention. Affects up to 80% of women, six months to two years or longer. I have a, an old slide that, that showed that um, there were some women that had uh, hot flashes for 20 years or longer. Okay. And when, when people come in to see me and they're complaining about hot flashes or night sweats or what, night sweats tend to happen first, by the way, in that whole litany of, of vasomotor symptoms. Um, you have to determine how bothersome they are. Now, the fact that they're coming in complaining about them indicates to me they're pretty darn bothersome. Um, but some women want to blow right through it and say, I'm going to gut it out and it's not that big a deal. And others say, it really affects my well-being and quality of life. And those are the folks you want to target and try to help. So here's the slide that says, yeah, measure those hormones and see what you're going to get. Because if you measure them up there at 256, they're going to say, wow, look at you, you're menopausal. And then look, it drops down to 20 and you have a period. So it just gives you an idea that, you know, these things are all in flux during that perimenopausal time frame. And we don't measure hormone levels anymore. And, let, and I, I don't unless I'm confused about something. So if I'm, for example, prescribing uh, hormone therapy for someone who chooses to use um, estrogen replacement and they're not getting symptom relief, and I'm wondering, is there an absorbency issue? Is there a you know, metabolism problem? Then I might draw, draw an estrogen level to see what's going on. But certainly not to establish menopause. One of my favorite all-time slides, the F5 of vasomotor symptoms. Um, <laughs> so if you, can, if you can read through the tornado here, um, you can see fatigue, interrupted sleep, fatigue, night sweats, all that kind of stuff. And it, it kind of gives you an idea of, um, you know, how they all build on each other to contribute to that bottom line of irritability, mood changes, and cognitive issues um, that can accumulate over time as well. So you're not going crazy. You don't have early onset dementia, probably. Um, it's just that, you know, th you're just not, not getting the restorative sleep, and estrogen could be the culprit. Okay, so we know about hormone therapy for the most part. And, you know, estrogen kind of got a bad rep when the Women's Health Initiative was released in 2002. And it said, whoa, 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 you know, don't take estrogen, you'll get breast cancer and all that kind of stuff, which I don't believe, by the way. Um, I do believe that if you've got an estrogen-dependent lesion in your breast, that hormone therapy, if it's an estrogen-supported cancer, hormone therapy is going to make that grow. I mean, that I have no issue with. But as far as, you know, 
instituting a cancer, I, I, I don't believe that, and I don't think most of the scientists do either. Um, I do believe that transdermal estrogens are safer from a standpoint of um, not being thrombogenic or, or pro-clotting. So I do try to, to prescribe transdermals, primarily patches, creams, gels, even sprays, which I probably have in there somewhere. Um, but this is a new compound, and this is Duovi. It came out of, about a year ago, and it is conjugated estrogen, Premarin, y'all, which has been around for 70 years, okay? And um, basodoxethene. So it's used for vasomotor symptoms, so hot flashes and night sweats. It's an oral. Now, let me back up and say that even though I prescribe transdermals a lot, I do have a hard time sometimes with women being able to get a therapeutic level. Um, and sometimes I'll, and actually more than, than, um, than not recently, I resort or go back to using an oral because they're just not getting systemic levels with the transdermals. I don't know why. Um, but I will measure hormone levels and they're just, I'd like to see an estradiol level of about 50. And, you know, it's like 20 or, you know, it's trying, but it's just not getting there with a patch. So, um, anyway, this is a new option. And the basodoxaphene, the second hormone here, is not, not a progestin. And if you go back into the Women's Health Initiative, one of the things that was not really said outright, but that was alluded to, that was that maybe the progestin was the bad player in all this. So this is an alternative to estrogen and progestin, which you have to have if a woman has a uterus. You've got to protect that uterus. So you've got to have both hormones on board. The estrogen is for the symptoms. The progestin is to keep the uterus, uh, to keep the lining of the uterus thin. So, um, you know, this does the job without being a progestin, okay? Do I think it's a good idea? I really do. I think this is a good um, a step in the right direction. <clears throat> and it blocks estrogen activity at the uterus and the breast. Now, there's not a lot of data that says that it's going to be, um, you know, helpful from a, a, a cancer prevention strategy at the breast, but it is anti-estrogenic at the breast. So we may see more as time goes on that says that this is actually, um, you know, a favorable option uh, when looking at breast health. I just started that two weeks ago, so I'm six years out, hot flashing to death. Uh huh. So I went back in and said, "We've got to do. I have to do something." So I started this and. It's gone from like a 10 to maybe a 3. It's okay. on the back burner, but it's not like flaming. Good. It's like so. Good. Well, important. I think this is a good product. Yeah, I really think it's a good How it's a, long should we take that? Because it talks about the shortest term possible. That The shortest term possible <laughs> is FDA speak. Let me just say that's on all the products. And it also comes from the North American Menopause Society. But I will tell you that they're taking a little bit of a step backwards on that over time, um, and they're saying, if you read the, the subsequent text on that, for the shortest period of time, to meet the treatment goals of the individual. So it's up to you as to what, what benefits you're getting from that. It really is. Now, the other thing is, look at that nice side effect in bullet number two. Prevention of osteoporosis. So that's a good thing. One of the things I'll say, too, about estrogen therapy, if, if you're on estrogen therapy, what a nice side effect. You're, you're going to get protection or prevention of, of osteoporosis. But once you stop it, that prevention piece is gone, and it goes pretty quickly. Okay. So um, I think this is a good idea. Uh, it's a Pfizer product. I don't have an agreement with Pfizer or anybody else, for that matter. Um, but I, I think, and, and, you know, Premarin has been around for forever, forever and ever and ever, so... So treatment of moderate to severe hot flashes due to menopause and the prevention of postmenopausal bone loss is for women who haven't had a hysterectomy. If you've had a hysterectomy, got rid of all that compartment that you're not using anymore, um, you don't need the progestin piece, so you can take estrogen only. And one of the things that came out of the Women's Health Initiative was that if you, um, if you use estrogen only, interestingly enough, the risk of breast cancer was, was decreased. That was the good news that kind of got lost in the shuffle. So that led people to make the assumption, correct or not, that maybe the progestin in that combination product really was sort of a bad player. Okay. 
shortest time possible, um, only as long as needed, and that's up to the individual. And when people say, how long should I take this? Should I try not taking it? It's up to you. Um, you can give yourself a holiday, you can taper down, see how you feel, um, and, and go from there. I mean, my mother-in-law, I remember, took Primarin, I think she took some crazy amount, like five milligrams, anyway, a lot, for 20 years. You know, and there have been women out there that did that and, and you know, had very healthy vaginal tissue, I'll say that much. Um, and, and, you know, I've done it for a long, long, long time and never had any, any sequelae, never uh, bad consequences. But, you know, she also had had a hysterectomy, and she's not, not an isolated case. Um, increased venous thromboembolic risk. Certainly if you're allergic to an estrogen, you don't want to use this, this compound. All oral estrogens are going to have an increased venous thromboembolic risk. I don't care what kind you take. Now, is that risk high? No, but it is something that goes into the labeling piece. The transdermals don't have that much of an increased VTE risk compared to the orals. That's still saying you've got a little compared to a little bit more. Okay. Now, Brisdell is another product that's out. It's been out about as long as, um, actually it's been out a little bit longer than uh, Duovi. It's non-hormonal. And it is, that's, that's its tagline. It's a non-hormonal therapy for moderate to severe hot flashing. Well, y'all, it's Paxil. Oh, okay. Okay? It's yeah. low-dose, time-released Paxil. So, um, 7.5 milligrams daily. It does work. Um, it takes about four weeks for it to really show a yield. And it's hard sometimes to get people to sign into that, which is why I like to preload folks with samples long enough to see if they're getting the benefit. Um, and, and, you know, women will say, now listen, I know this is not going to be generic. Why don't I just get some regular old Paxil and crunch it down to about 7.5 milligrams? And, again, the, the standard line is it hasn't been studied for that purpose, and we don't know that it's – and it's not the same um, release – it's not a, a you know long release system. It also, from what I understand, because Paxil um, was one of the, the harder ones from a standpoint of weight gain. Um, when you're looking at that class of drug SSRIs, Paxil was a bad player with weight. This one has not been. So it could well be that it's just because of the lower dose formula. Um, but here's another interesting bullet. Tamoxifen may not work as well if taken concurrently with Brisdell. So, you know, for those women, and, and, and why do I bring that up? Because this might be an option for hot flashes for women who've had breast cancer. Because they can't take a hormonal therapy. They would take a non-hormonal one, and if they're on tamoxifen at the same time as a chemotherapeutic agent for breast cancer, that I sure hope that red flag goes up out there to all those people who are prescribers. Um, and that, if I'm in a classroom, which I don't know when I'm, I'm going to do that again or not, but that's one of the things I jumped to the down about. So make sure that you've got that on a cell back here somewhere uh, that fires up. Side effects, um, generally within the first four weeks that abate, but it's a very low dose. So, um, but it does seem to work and did get FDA approval. So those are the newer ones for vasomotor symptoms, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the vagina. Um, and, and my feminist friends have a hard time with the term atrophy. Well, I can't help that. That's what the literature says. You know, it's atrophy. I don't know. Dried outedness? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know another word that's not quite so, you know, whatever. Um, but here's some of the percentages. 57% of sexually active menopausal women experience vulvovaginal dried outedness, atrophy. 55% um, experience sexual dysfunction, and 20% have urinary symptoms. You know, Viagra really did us in, in a lot of ways, um, <laughs> because there's no equivalent for women. There is yeah. none. Um, you can use, and it has been used, not FDA approved, Viagra has been used for orgasmic disorder in women and has been fairly successful. Um, but from a standpoint of desire disorders, or even desire changes. I'm not so sure it's a disorder, it's just a change. Um, it, there's not anything out there that has been proven to, to make that leap into you know, an equivalent with um, the response that men get from Viagra. Um, I, I don't know how many of you guys have compounding pharmacy influences up here, but we've got some certainly in Nashville. And 
I've had women that have, have come to see me with huge amounts of testosterone on board um, to the point where you're like, whoa, um, you know, hair growth where it shouldn't be and, and all kinds of things. And, and I, you know, I, I think that's a, a, a faulty plan um, that that has to be administered by someone who um, is really, really monitoring, you know, the, the impact and side effect profile that goes along with that. Um, we do get testosterone from our ovaries. Um, even if they're not producing estrogen so much in, in a menopausal woman, they still produce testosterone. Not in the same amount that we got when we were in our sort of reproductive um, time frame, but it's, they still do. Um, a, one of my students just produced a paper um, on DHEA um, that found that it really didn't make a daggone hill beans worth the difference. Um, that she actually got... Hmm. It didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference, it, but it was, a, it was a very low number, and it was a transdermal. So it was a skin preparation. So it's a precursor to testosterone, and um, she actually found that the people who were on the lowest dose had the best impact. It, 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 the, the data was completely confounded. I was like, whoa. But, you know, the numbers were small, and she used a trans, uh, uh, um, I don't know if it was a cream. But anyway, I think it's safe, and that's what I'm okay with, you know, and just see how it goes over time. And that's a standard dose, yeah. kind of lifted the mood, I thought, a little, or maybe I wanted it to. <laughs> Hey, if you think it's it yeah, hey, it okay. It's okay. And you know, the, the problem with this particular issue is that not many women seek medical attention. Um, it, this is, and I, I tell, I've told students this for years, this is something I can guarantee y'all. Everybody in this room is going to have bubble vaginal dried out of this. Okay? Everybody. It's just part of, and it's not pathology, it's, it's a physiologic change of menopause. You know, I think we, we, we get really close to classifying all this as, as pathology. It's, it's normal. It doesn't mean that it's comfortable, and it doesn't mean we tolerate it. It, it just, it's, this is what you're supposed to have happen to you. You know, your ovaries are not supposed to work after a certain point in time. Um, but, you know, from a standpoint of comfort, we can do things to help with that. All right? So... Now, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is a, a picture of a woman who's got uh, actually some um, introidal stenosis. So you've got dryness, vulvar vaginal irritation, burning, itching, and sometimes an increased discharge or odor that tends to be kind of a yellowish in color. And it, the, the discharge can actually burn because it's white cell discharge. You've got in, that the tissue thins <laughs> significantly. And because of that, it becomes irritated more easily just with normal vaginal flora, bacteria, and so forth, um, and white cells come on board to kind of mount a response to that irritation, and that's why you have discharge, okay? But that, that opening has become stenotic, um, so it's, it's, it, it's developed a bit of a ridge around it, so, um, and that, that's just all something that happens, um, certainly if you're not in a, um, a relationship where you're having intercourse. Unfortunately, these are smaller pictures, but, um, you know, I'm hoping you can kind of get a comparison. Um, if I want to see if your estrogen is working, all I really have to do is look at the vulva and the vagina because I can find out in a heartbeat. I don't have to do a, a blood test necessarily. Um, the vagina is sort of the last recipient of systemic estrogen or even local estrogen. If it's doing its job, I can see based on how the tissue looks, how the, the vagina looks, is have you know, a thickness to the vaginal epithelium, um, you know, does it have what looks like normal discharge and so on, physiologic discharge. The, I, tell, I used to tell students that the vagina of, uh, that's well estrogenized is, has sort of a wave-like pattern um, and makes it distensible. So I said, okay, vagina of a, of a uh, well estrogenized, estrogenized woman kind of looks like a ruffled potato chip. Okay? The vagina of a woman without estrogen kind of looks like a Pringle. It's flat. Okay, there's no ruffle pattern in there. And, they, you know, my students sometimes will go, oh. But <laughs> I'm a visual learner, and that kind of made sense to me. Um, but the, the epithelium, the, the outside becomes thin. The tissue becomes thinner. Um, so it's more susceptible to irritation and breakdown. And we'll talk about um, what happens to the bladder as well once that environment is established. So, 
you know, just the how things look tells me a lot about estrogen support. So estrogen receptor concentrations, you know, it's not as if the, the bladder and the vagina are separated by a big expanse. So um, if you can keep the vagina healthy, and particularly for older individuals, which we're talking about here uh, at this meeting, if you can keep the vagina healthy, you can keep the bladder much healthier as well. So here's the mechanism, just so um, I'll remind myself not to forget something. Um, you, you, what discharge basically is just um, cells that are replacing themselves. So like this, if I do this, there are millions of cells that are being released. When that happens in the vagina, you have discharge. It's physiologic. Um, but you don't have that replacement to the, to the degree, certainly, that you have when estrogen is there. Um, and when estrogen is in the vagina supporting the tissues, you have healthy bacteria come on board as, as resident bacteria that keep unhealthy bacteria out of that environment. So when that healthy bacteria is no longer there, you can colonize the vagina with E. coli, okay? And E. coli can get into the bladder and cause bladder infections. And as you all know, older women are very susceptible um, to bladder infections. And um, I am actually was talking uh, earlier this morning to a friend of mine whose mom is in um, a nursing home facility and she said, I think my mother's got another bladder infection because she's talking crazy again. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it, people, sometimes, unfortunately, how they get diagnosed is it affects their, um, their cognition, you know. And um, so if we can change the pH, make it a hostile environment to E. coli just by making estrogen more a resident um, hormone there and bringing good bacteria back on board, then we might be able to decrease the incidence of bladder infections in these women um, before they get to the point where, as my friend Penny says, mama's talking crazy. Mm -hmm. So, um, painful uh, urination, recurrent urinary tract infections, overactive bladder. And again, you may not have the symptoms that, you know, like we had when we were younger of the burning urination, like, oh, oh I know that's a bladder infection. It may just be that you're, you're going a lot and not noticing that, that, you know, this is, you know, potentially a, a urinary tract infection. Um, and then pain with intercourse, vaginal bleeding associated with sexual activity, all of this is, is fairly common um, in the absence of that good support that we had with estrogen. Is it pathology? UTI, yeah. Um, but, you know, some of the other things that happen, you know, with, with the vagina, that's a physiologic change of aging. We just have to support that, um, that change so that, you know, some of these occurrences don't happen that can impact quality of life and can impact health if, if things go awry. So uh, recurrent urinary tract infections, um, three times in 12 months or two times in six months is considered recurrent. And um, the thinning of the urothelium, so the thinning of all of that tissue also happens around the bladder neck, around the bladder tube, the urethra, all of that occurs. It's not just the, the, the vagina. So um, associated issues, overactive bladder, incontinence. And, you know, we don't talk about that very much. Um, and, and I think that a couple of my students who were doctoral students actually did papers on um, overactive bladder and the, the problem that it is in our population that women just, you know, I saw a commercial uh, a couple of days ago on, you know, cute depends. Um, and that just seems like it an oxymoron, cute depends, um, you know, so you can get sort of like pull-ups for your kids. Maybe, maybe we can get, you know, Oscar on the back of our depends, or Cookie Monster, I don't know, but it's not, you know, we can do better than that, I think. Um, so I put a couple of cases up here. Here's Sandra, she's 62, young like us, like me, sexually active, but she's having recurrent ur urinary tract infections, she's overweight, and she's got high blood pressure. Now, the problem that Penny's having with her mama, Penny's a nurse, a nurse practitioner, which makes her not so popular in the nursing home environment sometimes, um, they won't treat her mother without the urine culture coming back. Now, we know that mama's got a UTI. Almost, she said, if I had some macrodant and I'd give it to her right now, and I said, well, you know, I can't help you there. But, um, I mean, she's doing the same presentation she had the last time, so we're going to wait until this gets to a kidney. Anyway, so we're, we're, she's talking to me back and forth as I'm driving down the road. But urine culture, okay. But you can also spin a urine and find white cells for goodness. Mm -hmm. um, 
upper and lower tract imaging, you can determine whether or not, if you think it's necessary or the, the clinician thinks it's necessary, is there some kind of abnormality in the, in the bladder or kidney if that hasn't been looked at and you think there's a reason for it. Local estrogen will fix vulvovaginal atrophy very quickly and with very little systemic impact. So vaginal tablets, 10 micrograms at night for two weeks and then twice weekly, those things look like little, if y'all remember, saccharin tablets, really tiny. And the nice thing about them is that the, the, um, the thing that introduces them is smaller diameter than this pen is here. So for women that have that stenosis that we saw in that earlier picture, the um, applicator is about the size of the end of this. So you can go past that stenosis and get one of these into the back part of the vagina and it would work really nicely. They actually drop the dosage, it's, it's called Vagifem. They drop the dosage from 25 micrograms to 10 over the past five years. So, you know, that idea of going low and, and being in therapeutic doses is, is, you know, we're really kind of narrowing things down much, much more than we ever did before and it's working well. So you just do it twice um, or nightly for two weeks so it can, while you're you know, reclined or asleep it can absorb well, and then twice weekly. That's it. So it's a pretty easy regimen. Use a lubricant during sex, void before and after intercourse. Now, there's some different um, information on this. And with respect to voiding after intercourse, if you go into the restroom, this is for anybody at any age, you go to the restroom and all you're going to have is two dribbles, don't. Wait until you've got enough of a stream of urine to push whatever bacteria might have gotten into the urethra out. The two dribbles won't make a difference. How many of us went into that? Okay. Um, so pain with sex, 40% of women with vaginal atrophy report it. I've had a number of patients that just like, I don't know what to do. Um, and so there, there are a number of strategies that will work here. Um, and, and I've employed a lot of them over the years, including use of you know, particularly for the women that have introidal issues, uh, a cotton ball soaked with xylocaine gel placed in the vaginal introitus at night for a couple of weeks just rested there at bedtime so you're sleeping. Maybe you put a, a pad or something to hold it in place. Kind of numbs that area and you get, a, a, over time, you actually, and this is what the, the folks that do this, you know, is their primary thing. This is one of the things that they use um, as a therapy and it works really pretty well. So kind of like that one because it's low intervention, you know. Some screening. Somebody ought to ask. Do you ever have burning sensation when you have sex? Do um, you ever hear bleeding after sex? Do you get bladder infections very often? And then what I do is look for things like this. You know, inflammation. Vaginal pH testing is costs like negative five cents. I mean, it's, it's a piece of strip paper that you can apply against the sidewall of the vagina. It gives you a lot of information um, that people should be doing. So here's Lisa. She's um, here for a well woman visit. Her husband's there to discuss sexual issues. He's probably on, you know, Cialis. Um, so um, an estrogen cream is also an option. The estrogen creams vaginally are good because you can work around that exterior part. The tablet's only going to go into the, the back part of the vaginal ball. The cream you can actually apply to that stenosis and to that vulvar area but you use about that much. You know, the old adage of, well, that stuff's just so messy, I'm not going to do it. Well, all you use is a tiny bit, and you dose it the same way. At bedtime, about a gram in the vagina, and then rub on the outside um, for two weeks, and then twice weekly maintenance. Now, as a little pearl, uh, Premarin actually works better than esterase, and I don't get paid by Premarin. Um, and uh, it should, you'd have to dose it less for some reason. And all of these, for some crazy reason, are expensive. It's like they've got you by the throat. I, I just, mm -hmm. but anyway. Now, is that over, the, can't you buy that over the counter? Mm -hmm. Well, in some of the health food stores, or there's, I've heard there's a chiropractor in town that has the estrogen cream. Well, maybe they so. do. This is just the FDA stuff, so okay. I don't know. Okay. I, I honestly don't know about that. So you steer away from it. <coughs> there well, are health food store creams. They're mm -hmm. phytoestrogens is what they are. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So Just like don't put don't yogurt up it. in there, y'all. Don't put yogurt up in there. <laughs> don't, no. Mm. Don't put yogurt. <laughs> no. People have done that, you know. Yeah. You can't, there's a woman named Sharon Hillier. She's got a PhD in microbiology. And she's been looking at 
colonizing healthy bacteria in the vagina for years, and you can't do it. She's, she's finally got a, uh, a, a suppository that she thinks is working to colonize the vagina with healthy bacteria, but I, every year, Dr. Mark, can we, can you, no. <laughs> Don't go down there and put Danon up in your vagina. <laughs> <laughs> because you can't colonize it with healthy lactic acid producing lactobacilli. It might feel better because it's cold, but that's about all you're going to get out of it. So, people are, and at one, I'll say this quickly, one year I, I had, I used to teach the medical students how to do pelvic exams, and one year I had a woman with me who didn't do them very often as, a, as a, an instructor. She actually did uh, gerontology care, so she put, she put a speculum in, she goes, she comes running out of there, and she goes, Ann, I'm not doing this anymore. So what happened? She goes, I put a speculum in, I hear it's clunk, and I'm like, okay, what was it? Garlic. What? A woman had put a garlic clove in the vagina. Now, if you read some of the holistic kind of offshoot stuff, garlic they will use to, for a healthy vaginal ecosystem. Completely unencumbered by data, let me just tell you that. So she was so traumatized, she said, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> so, but yeah, a, spec, a clunk is not supposed to happen when you put a speck in. Let me just put it that way. Um, now another another little uh, item that, that women use uh, vaginally that I think is absolutely phenomenal is estrain. It's a ring. It's about this big. It goes in the vagina and it stays for three months. Okay. Um, certainly you have to have the ability to insert that. So if you've got a, an individual who has that stenosis, you've got to work through that before you can put that ring in. So um, it's a real hero in some of the nursing home settings because, you know, you don't have to use the cream. You don't have to use the tablets. If you can get beyond those and have this ring inserted for those ladies, it really does make a difference. Um, and it's a three-month option. So you've got to tell you some personal experience with those. Um, you, you've got to have, um, you know, the, the ability to pass it through the, the vaginal introitus. Um, so when do you treat, you know, people who are having discomfort? Um, pelvic um, prolapse, um, I, I will say that prior to my um, pelvic uh, surgery, um, I was, I, I will tell you that I've, I lost a few estrings into the, the sewer system of Nashville, unbeknownst to me at the time. Um, which speaks to the issue of, of pelvic prolapse or organ. Pelvic prolapse is, is quite an issue, but yeah. Um, the, I could drop a ring in a heartbeat. So a lot of women, as they get older, don't have the integrity of the pelvic musculature. Um, and my, my PCP or my GYM ago, how's that, how's that estrogen? I don't know. I lost another one. I just went to the restroom, and now it's gone. So uh, you got to be able to be able to hang on to that thing once you've got it in place. So, um, yeah, people don't, people use a lot of things that they shouldn't to try to fix the system or the, the vaginal ecosystem with, you know, talking about things like yogurts, douching, no. And there are women that will still do that um, despite the fact that you're potentially, you know, introducing bacteria further up into the reproductive system um, and also potentially washing out the good bacteria. So we keep saying no douching, no douching, no douching. Um, and bathing, you know, tub baths, um, again, can wash out healthy bacteria. Now, lubricants and moisturizers. Um, moisturizers maintain hydration. You'll see them over the counter, things like Refresh and Replens. Refresh pH is intended to change the pH and make it more acidic. It doesn't have a long-lasting effect, but it's certainly worth, you know, worth trying. Um, and lubricants temporarily moisten, so there's a little bit of a, of a difference, certainly, in, in what you're picking up, and I think sometimes folks don't appreciate that there is a difference. So non-hormonal uh, therapies, and here's kind of the, uh, the Luvina uh, is actually a, a, one of my more, more favorite options. Um, applied at the time of intercourse, I will say that my favorite thing to recommend to women is coconut oil. Okay, the molecule is much better for the, the vaginal epithelium. The sex therapist will say that that's their, um, their standard recommendation is coconut oil. Okay. This slide set that I helped produce with the um, um, Association of Reproductive Health Professionals that don't use any oils, and I took it out. Um, because it, certainly if you're worried about an STD and you, you know, might be using a condom or whatever, 
you can't use an oil-based product. But if you're using something for lubrication during intercourse and that's not on the concern list or the radar, then oils are better. And uh, coconut oil is the one that the sex counselors and therapists are recommending. Uh -huh. I have a jar of coconut oil in my cabinet. Every morning I give my dog a tablespoon of coconut oil in her food. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> It's great for the so skin, too. So ready and waiting for me. <laughs> there you go. You're good to go. Good to go. Well, in Costco, back home, you know, they've got these jars like this. So my husband and I are walking through Costco, and he goes, my gosh, that'll last a lifetime. And I go, no, Rich, you can also cook with it. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, anyway. the dog. Yeah. yeah. And, and give it to your dog. I give it so to there you dog. have it. It's for um, the tartar on her teeth to break it down, and it does a beautiful job of really? breaking down tartar on dogs' teeth. Well, I'm going to have to get some to Buster when I get home. <laughs> My grandson has eczema, and she uses coconut oil. That's all she's ever used. Yeah, it's, it's, and now it's solid. It's like butter. Yeah. And uh, yeah. one of my patients said, well, what do you do about the chunks? I said, what chunks? She said, well, the kind I have has chunks in it. I said, I don't know a thing in the world about chunks, but it's not supposed to do that. It's just so. white and foamy. You know, mm -hmm. like, it's it's like cocoa butter. It's, it's supposed to, to melt when it hits your skin. So. I don't know where she got it, but anyway. Um, so here's some of the moisturizers. Now, not as effective. You know, again, yogurt, omega three supplements, and 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 women sometimes will take um, a vitamin E capsule and put it in the vagina, and that's I guess okay. But I don't know how the vitamin E gets out of that capsule unless you squeeze it really hard. Um, so, you know, people will use different, different strategies, um, you know, with you know, lack of data to support it, but if it works for them and it's not causing harm, okay. Femring down there in the bottom right corner is a, is a vaginal um, delivery system that gives you systemic hormone. Um, and it never really got a, a lot of press, and that's unfortunate because I do like delivery systems that are unique and, and not necessarily oral. Um, Vagifem is up in that right corner, um, and that's the one that gives you that little saccharin tablet in the back part of the vagina, Premarin, Estrace, and here's Estring, uh, the three-month ring that goes into the vagina and, and really does a nice job of giving support and low-dose estrogen. Here's some of the, the uh, local strategies and gives you an idea of how to use them. I think we pretty much covered those. So those are the two products that are um, continuous use. The one at the bottom also treats hot flashes. The one at the top doesn't. It's much, much lower dose. Um, but again, it's really nice for women who, um, who are in, in, well, just anybody, but women who are in institutional settings and they can't uh, access those, those vaginal regimens that require a you know, fairly routine dosing pattern. Do you have to use some kind of a, uh, like a uh, progestin? Against those Great or? question. And the answer to that is no. I mean, <laughs> now, it, class labeling will tell you uh -huh. yes. Because it, you know, anytime you use an estrogen, you got to use a progestin. But the dosing of this is so low that they're, that, you know, they, the experts, say no. Even with the one that does the systemic hormone, you would say No, with that one you do. Okay, yes, you yes, 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 okay. absolutely. With femring you do, but okay. not with estrogen. Okay. And here again is Vagifem. Very easy. Now, the new option that's oral for velvovaginal dried out of this or atrophy is Osphena. And um, again, I'm, I'm much more of an advocate for using something local to treat a, a, a local problem, but there are women who want to take a tablet. They don't want to fool with anything down there. They don't want to insert anything. They don't want any creams. They don't want any... And this has been shown to be effective. And you've probably seen some commercials on this. Um, you know, talking about pain with sex, and it's usually around the nightly news time because they're trying to compete with the time spot that Viagra or Cialis has had for years. Um, it says it's not an estrogen, but it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, so it is kind of an estrogen. Um, again, to treat moderate to severe dyspareunia, just to give you an idea, it's saying it's not an estrogen. And the study showed that the pH was changed, um, that vaginal dryness was improved, um, no cases of venous thromboembolism, no hyperplasia, no thickness to the lining of the uterus, in other words, and no cancer. So in stroke risk, um, you know, a little bit higher versus, well, hemorrhagic, um, a little bit higher than, than placebo. DVTs or, or blood clots, a little bit higher than placebo, but it's associated with hot flashing, so it's not an all-over. 
any, any kind, time you've got a selective estrogen receptor um, strategy, it's, it's not going to give you the all-over coverage you're going to get with a plain old estrogen. So at one year, there was no cancer. Um, there was a little bit of endometrial thickening in some women. Um, so do you have to use a progestin with this, the comp or progesterone? The company is saying no, but you have to watch or be on, on the lookout, do appropriate surveillance. So I'm not real convinced about... Um, you know, how, how much you have to be on the lookout for postmenopausal bleeding in these people. I have not used this yet in patients. Now, with some drugs like uh, Diflucan or um, another um, azo um, antifungal, if you use that in concert or conjunction with osphenia, you're going to have two times the exposure in uh, Diflucan and one and a half times almost the exposure of ketoconazole um, if this drug is used. So these two drugs are going to be increased from a standpoint of metabolism in, in the presence of osphenia. Okay. So here's Anne's, not me. Uh, 55, she's got some va uh, vaginal discomfort. Um, she's got some, you know, pain with sex. And she can use estrogen cream, lubricants, digital stimulation, manipulation with vaginal dilators. Um, women need to know if they don't that it takes longer to reach arousal, and I think men need to hear that as well as women get older because the clitoral hood actually covers the clitoris a little bit more as we get older, so it takes longer to get there. Be patient. Everybody. Women, men, everybody. It just takes longer. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It just, it's just part of what we experience as we get older. And I think a lot of that messaging just never gets where it needs to go. Bioidenticals, there's no data that says that they're any safer or work any better um, than the ones that are approved by the FDA. So quickly, screening guidelines, I know I'm going over. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, as you all know, recommends screening uh, for ages 21 to 65 with cytology every three years. Because Peggy wanted me to, to you know, bring this up, too, to let you all know what's happening in women's health uh, sort of at a, at a glance. So no PAPs every year. Don't need them. And if you get PAPs with a negative HPV, you can go to every five years. How about that? It's kind of, kind of heresy. I've been in practice for a while, and I'm like, ooh. But, you know, they're looking now, or have looked at what HPV does over time. Um, now, have I had outliers? Absolutely. We all do. But these guidelines are made for what is um, average and typical. And, and unfortunately, insurance listens to this as well. All right. Um, women over 65 who had regular cervical cancer testing with normal results should not be tested for cervical cancer. Once it's stopped, you shouldn't start it again. Even if she decides she's going to, you know, have sex with the football team. It, you, <laughs> no, don't do it anymore. Women with a history of a serious cervical precancer should continue to be tested for at least 20 years after that diagnosis, even if it's past age 65. Okay. Woman's had her uterus removed in her <coughs> cervix, so you don't have to test her anymore because you're looking for cervical cancer. What about vaginal cancer? What about vulvar cancer? Well, that's why they should still come in and let us look. Okay? But I don't know if you saw the recommendation from family practice that said they're really actually looking at the idea of this getting rid of the annual pelvic exam. American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology says, uh-uh, we don't buy into that. So we haven't changed the way we view things in the GYN arena yet. Yearly mammograms recommended starting at age 40 and continuing for as long as a woman's in good health. Clinical breast exam that I do for y'all, if you come in to see me, about every three years for women in their 20s and 30s and yearly after 40. Women should know their breasts normally, how they look and feel, and report any change. Breast self-exam is an option for women starting in their 20s. Flex sig, these are... These are ors, by the way, not all. <laughs> Flex sig every five, or colonoscopy every ten, or not the whole list here uh, for colon cancer screening. And so, um, just to wrap up, um, what happens? You know, menopausal women, 2014. You know, we're not doing as much from a surveillance standpoint, and I think that's unfortunate because you don't get to come in and have conversations about what hurts when you have sex, or. Um, you know, having hot flashes or, you know, this, that, or the other. And, and hopefully women won't be uh, dissuaded from coming in and just seeing a provider to talk about just how well they are, not because something hurts or something's out of whack. Um, but I still do annual exams. And what I say to patients now is, come on, you know, 
Scoot on down towards me. I want to just make sure everything looks healthy. And instead of, I'm going to do your pap smear now. So um, it, it's been a it's been a, a real evolutionary change for me having started this uh, practice in my 25 years ago. It's like, you know, the more we know, the less we do, kind of. But um, I think I, I think it's a good thing. You know, we're not you know, we're not compromising women's fertility by doing procedures to their services. You know, and, um, and we're not, you know, doing aggressive procedures on women in their 80s for breast cancer when, you know, the treatment's probably worse than just watching the process. So, anyway, that, that's my spiel for today, and I appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions or let y'all go out and get candy or whatever you want to do. So, thank you very much. <laughs>